My name is Stanley Soar, and I have the great pleasure to sit there with Nushin Ajikani, Associate Professor at Harvard, Professor in Gothenburg at Sahlgrenska, and you are a specialist at autism. Yes. It's um, something that the, the scientific view has changed within your lifespan on this disease. Yes. Or perhaps not even disease. Yes. Now it's more... A condition. A, yeah, yeah, a condition of, yeah. of humanity, so to say. And if, you're, if you have autism, there you have some strengths and there's a lot of weaknesses that makes it hard to live, but you're also stronger in some sense. Yes. You could have better memory, you could have better... Uh, be, be more focused over longer periods of time. And, and uh, you're, you're a researcher on the brain. Mm-hmm. What do you see within the brain? What, what is different when if you have autism compared to people who don't? Uh, well, we are looking for anatomical differences and, and that's a new research that I'm doing and, and we'll see if, if we can see uh, indeed uh, these small differences that uh, other people have seen on, on the brain itself. Mm. We're trying to do that with imaging. But in terms of function of the brain, it's very interesting to see that for some type of, of stimuli, people with autism and typical people have exactly the same amount of activation. For example, uh, for stimuli that are supposed to elicit empathy, like if you show people suffering, mm. you realize that there is no difference between the brain of people with autism and, and typical people, meaning they have the same amount of empathy when they see people suffering. But if you show other uh, type of stimuli, for example, people with a fearful face looking away at something, mm. uh, to, like pointing with the eyes towards a danger versus looking straight, uh, typical people will have much more activation for the eyes looking at indicating the presence of a danger than straight away. Yeah. And people with autism don't show that, meaning that they don't understand the signal that is given by uh, the eyes looking towards this danger. We also see that um, when you force people to look in the eyes uh, with autism, the amygdala, which is a part of the brain that's important for threat perception, gets mm. much more activated. And that, so they, they feel eye contact as a very threatening and stressful thing. Mm. And so that's something that's interesting to to uh, follow and, and see whether treatment can actually normalize that and, mm. and help them feel less stressful by eye contact. And you're working with eye tracking machines now. There's yes. a lot of uh, groundbreaking with self-driving cars and, and those kind of uh, things coming out. The eye tracking yes. industry is, is booming, so to yes. say. No, it's, it's... And you can use their technology as well. So it's very interesting because when you use eye tracking, you can suddenly see how people are seeing the world, mm. which was almost impossible to do before. And so you can see what they focus on and how much time they spend looking at this or that thing. You can also measure uh, pupil size, which is a good indicator of, of stress and, and uh, other things. So it's, uh, we're doing a lot of research about that. And, and uh, actually today <laughs> came out a, a paper showing that people with autism have the same amount uh, of pupillary reaction to happy or sad faces than, than typical people showing that they do have this unconscious normal uh, affective empathy, mm. which I think is very important. And what would you say autism is? What is autism? Huh. Uh, autism is uh, a series of behavior that uh, results from a brain that is different. Uh, and probably it's a brain that's too excitable. Uh, and not in, that doesn't have a good balance between excitation and inhibition. And I think that what happens uh, in consequence of that is that people become oversensitive to faces, to eyes. Mm. Because when, when you're born, the, the one of thing that you see the most are faces. I mean, most kids, I mean, babies, they, they just interact with other faces a lot. Yeah. And if you have... Um, 
the, the system that processes faces in babies, we're born with that. Actually, even before we're born, if you can see that fetuses are sensitive to three dots that would look like two eyes and a mouth, they mm-hmm. turn to, if you, if you put light through the womb, yeah. uh, that looks like this face, like they, they will turn towards that. Uh, so we, we are born with a system that's called the subcortical system that is there to detect faces. Hmm. And babies detect faces and, and then they see them a lot. And then the brain areas that then will take over face perception take over and, and the social brain gets uh, constructed normally. But for people with autism, because there is too much excitation in the brain, when they look at faces and then look at eyes, hmm. this system gets over connected because we know that if there is a lot of excitation, things connect more. Hmm. We, we say what wires together fires, what fires together wires together. And uh, so they will become oversensitive to eyes and that will activate the threat system, the amygdala, which mm. is part of this system. And because they feel threatened by that, they will look away and they will have less face um, contact, if you want. Mm. They will le- less face experience. And so their social brain will develop less well. And that has all the consequences that, that we know. And today, what do we know helps people with autism? How can... How can they be helped? Uh, I think they can be helped by many ways. First of all, they they need to be understood and and, and other people need to realize that they are much more sensitive to a lot of things than we are. They are more sensitive to sounds, to smells, to, to, uh, you know, touch and and, and, and things like that. So that Mm. we need to create an environment for them that is where they can feel relaxed and and safe Mm. i think that is one thing that we can help with them with second is to try to uh it's it's okay that they don't look at you in the eyes and and not not force people uh to do that because it's it's they will tell you it's painful some Mm. recently some somebody somebody told me it's torture Mm. Um, so so accept the fact that uh they are not lying to you and they are not trying to avoid anything they just for them it's difficult so Mm. accept that but also maybe slowly train them to to get better at that Mm. uh, in order to have better interaction for people who don't necessarily know they have autism Mm. and um and and it's something that's you're you're born with autism. autism yes yes and and there's a one of 64 people yes. roughly and mostly men mostly men it seems like although it's it also appears that females are much less diagnosed because they behave differently hmm. and uh, often they are diagnosed much later uh, a boy with autism will stay apart and, and avoid uh, groups. A girl with autism will stay exactly in the middle and camouflage by imitating. Mm-hmm. And that works pretty well until you're a teenager. And when you're a teenager, then everything goes wrong. And, and often they are either not diagnosed or diagnosed uh, with things that are secondary to their autism, which is anxiety, depression, eating disorders, mm. uh, suicide attempts. Uh, you mm. know, it's, it's a, girls with autism have a very tough life, I think, because they are under-recognized. And, and, uh, is there anything we can do today to, to, to soothe on that, to, to um, take that away, that pain? Well, I think we we can be aware of it. Is is mm. I, I think very important. But there's important. no medicine or. And there, I mean, we are hoping that there is a a, a, a new and old medicine. It's it's a very old medicine uh, because it's a, it's it's a diuretic mm. that is more than forty years old, but that. Um, in phase three now. A uh, phase three now that uh, rest- supposedly should help to restore the balance between excitation and inhibition in the brain by by uh, playing with the level of chloride in the cells, and uh, and we'll see if if that keeps its promises, then it would be really a, a big help for the core symptoms of autism. Mm. And 
a small percentage of people with autism mm-hmm. are savants. Yes. So that they have extraordinary skills on 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 memory. Yeah. And on you told us a couple of stories before. Um, there's a boy. Yeah. So Rome. there is a, a, a well, he's an adult now, but there yeah. is a movie of him uh, when he was a, a boy. He was a non-verbal until he was six or seven years old. His name is Stephen Welchar. And once they flew him on a helicopter over Rome, they have another one on Tokyo. I mean, he did that several times. But the one on Rome is is pretty amazing because he flew for only 15 minutes over Rome. And then they placed him into this huge uh, piece of paper. And for several days, he drew Rome with exquisite details to the Mm. point that every column of the St. Peter place was there. And uh, Mm. so he had... This, this photographic memory, uh, he only needed 15 minutes of looking at things and then it was in his brain and he was able to draw it. Mm. How he did that is just mm. it's amazing. And those abilities, are, are, are they is one in a thousand or so on? Uh, I, yeah, the, the numbers that people normally put forward is, is 1% of people with autism mm. have seven abilities. Mm. But sometimes also they don't tell you. I mean, I once by chance, I, I, I realized that one of the person I was working with, uh, one of the participants, he had this this calendar, a savant thing. It's so so people you tell them any day mm. of any year and they will tell you it was a Thursday. It, for example, mm. and uh, even if they're not very good at math, mm. apparently, but somehow they know. Can they appreciate it as a skill as well, or do you see it as a curse to be so good at something? Uh, I think being good at that is not really a curse, uh, but... Because uh, if you're a special child, sometimes it's, it's even harder. Uh, it could be. I mean, often the people who have some abilities also have intellectual disabilities so 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 it's uh but not always because uh you have people like uh daniel tamat who is extremely intelligent knows i don't know how many languages learned iceland to speak icelandic in a week Mm. and he's the one who was able to recitate uh I don't even remember the number of decimals of pi but but very Mm. huge amount and and so and but he's a great writer as well, and and he wrote this book, uh, Born on a Blue Day, which is a fantastic mm. book. Um, so, yeah. And and uh, throughout history, mm. are there people with um, autism that you can, because you read a lot, do you see those uh, persons that, but without them diagnosed? So yes, yeah, so I mean it's you know it's always difficult to say because the. Autism was re- recognized as a diagnosis only in the 40s. Mm. So it's t- to retro diagnose things is always a little, uh, you know, adventurous. But when you read some descriptions of some people, such as Newton, for example, mm. uh, uh, you realize that probably he was on the spectrum, uh, which is funny because he's the one who described the spectrum of light Mm -hmm. as well but uh, he would you know have these very strong routines and uh, he would go and 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 teach and even if there was no student in the auditorium because he was supposed to teach from this hour to that hour Uh he would still keep on teaching and uh, on an empty auditorium so that's that's something that you you know a typical person probably wouldn't do and then, uh, you know, people say that Einstein uh, never spoke until he was five or six years old, which mm-hmm. would be something that would also go uh, mm-hmm. with autism. And uh, other people say that Beethoven had uh, autistic mm-hmm. uh, uh, traits. Um, so, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of very brilliant people you could retro-diagnose with autism. And you perhaps see a lot of them because you're working in Harvard and MIT, <laughs> yeah, so, where the elite of the elite, of the specialized field. Yeah, it's true that uh, lots of engineers mm. definitely uh, have a lot of autistic mm. traits uh, and are brilliant people. So yeah. yeah, you see like the Silicon Valley TV series yes. where, where, where you know smart people but without social skills. So, so, so there was something uh, interesting that was described at some point. Um, there was a lot of children born 
with the diagnosis of aut- I mean, they, that got the diagnosis of autism after they were born in the Silicon Valley, and and so there was this autism epidemic, and people were wondering what is going on. Is there something in the water and mm-hmm. uh, in the air and so forth? And then they went to uh, look at who the parents of these uh, children were, and they all happened to be software engineers mm-hmm. uh, that kind of combine their genes and and uh. and basically uh suddenly there were much more people with autism uh-huh. in that in that area of the world so because you said it increases now in the world compared to so previous. there is there is an increase in diagnosis um and a lot of it is due because we know more about autism so people who would never had gotten a diagnosis before now get a diagnosis mm. so there is, that's not a true increase of the mm. prevalence it's a, it's a better recognition uh on the other hand uh and maybe not in sweden i think it depends from place to place uh but for sure in the us there might be a true increase as well because of of uh environment it's known that certain substances in the environments, uh, uh, in pollutants, uh, mm. DDT and, and uh, uh, other pesticides and so forth, mm. they do increase the risk of autism. Mm. So because autism is a combination between gene and environment, um, yeah. and the environment becoming more and more challenging, yes, there is and, an increase. And uh... If young people today want to, you know, work in the field to to help people mm-hmm. with autism, what would be the best ways to, uh, the best paths to take, so to say? Is it to become a doctor or a um, therapist or? I think becoming a, I think first of all they should go and work with people with autism and mm. and get a first hand experience of of what it is uh to to be with these children or young adults and and what their needs are and then it's, yeah it depends what you want to do i i think you can help them being uh, a speech therapist or being a doctor or mm. being a psychologist or being i mean they need a lot of of people from different specialties to be to be helped so yeah. so depending on what your main interest is i think there is there's a lot of opportunities and for families if you have a sibling or or or, or a child mm-hmm. or a friend that has uh, this what would we pass pieces of advice for them i think they need to realize that children with autism have a very challenging life and difficult life and even those who are going to a normal school and 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 perform at their best they spend a huge amount of energy to do something that to other people is a very instinctive normal thing to do mm. so they need to be allowed to have time off and they need to be allowed to rest mm. and recharge their batteries because uh it it's very difficult for them to to mm. be performing at a at at a normal level if you want mm. it requires much more energy than than another person fantastic nushin warm thank you and the best of luck thank in you. your important research for the future thank you thanks a lot thanks a lot thank you.